Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. There is so much talk today about how divided we are. In fact, today, arguing about politics sometimes seems to be the only thing we have in common. But there was a time not too long ago when sports and entertainment, movies and television provided our common language. TV shows and movies became iconic. The stuff of water cooler conversation, shared imagery, and creative analysis. In a way, we were all critics, and it was good. It provided a common framework for us, and one of those movies that fit that bill was Marty Scorsese's Goodfellows. Twenty years ago, it shot its way into theaters and has, to this day, become part of our popular lexicon. We're going to talk about that today with my guest, Glenn Kenny. He writes film criticism for RogerEbert.com, the Criterion Collection blog Current, and Vanity Fair Online. He was a senior editor and chief film critic for Premier Magazine, and his writing has appeared in numerous other publications. He's the author of numerous books, and his latest is Made Men, The Story of Goodfellas. Glenn Kenny, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. And yeah, if film provided us with a common language, Goodfellas provided us with some pretty profane language, um, for sure. In a general sense, and we'll get into it with deeper here, what was it about the movie, about Goodfellas, that has stuck with us? It was more than just the language. There was, there was a lot more that was no. iconic about it. No, that's for sure. I think uh, there's a lot of different factors. Even though gangster movies had long have been a part of American cinema since nine, since over 100 years ago, since 1915, 1905 even, uh, there were gangster films. Um, Goodfellas was kind of looked like an entirely new thing in gangster movies. There's the realism, the dynamics of it, the characters who are these, um, you know, foot soldiers for the... Uh, for the mafia uh, doing their anarchic, crazy thing, and the uh, the pace, the music, the whole thing was a was a was a rush that was both exhilarating and scary. And uh, so, um, I think the impression that it made when it was first released, and then continued to make when it was uh, shown in iterations on cable and in home video, uh, has been uh, has been really a, a con- contributing factor to it's becoming a kind of a a touchstone movie, and also the influence it had, to be sure. And talk a little bit about the decision that went into making this movie. It, like all movies, it could have just as easily not gotten made, and there was certainly a sense that maybe gangster movies had played themselves out a bit. Yeah, there's certainly that, and although the, the year 1990, The Goodfellas came out, actually saw several other pretty prominent gangster films, including The Godfather Part Three and a movie called King of New York, a movie called... Um, State of Grace, uh, which is about the Irish mob. But, um, you know, one, you know, Nicholas Pileggi, who had been writing for New York magazine, he wrote the book Wise Guy on which uh, Goodfellas was based. And uh, the key to all this is Henry Hill. Henry Hill was such an interesting character and such a talker, and he had such a storytelling style that he kind of determined the voice of both Pileggi's book Wise Guy about Hill's uh, time in the uh, working for an underboss of the Lucchese family in uh, in Queens, New York, and also in Boston, uh, doing that point shaving uh, college basketball scheme. Uh, Henry Hill was a, a real talker, unlike a lot of mafia guys, and he set the tone. And you know, when the book came out, there were a lot of other people who wanted to to uh, to make it into a movie, and one of them was Brian De Palma. And even though Nicholas Pileggi uh, was knew Brian De Palma, was friendly with Brian De Palma, liked Brian De Palma's work, he thought, no, um, Brian's not the right guy for this. And the guy who he did think was the right guy for it was, was Martin Scorsese. And fortunately, Martin Scorsese had come across the book himself and uh, decided, independent of Pileggi's, you know, uh, sort of fantasy league filmmaker idea, that he did want to do this material. And they met and they started working on a uh, on the basis of a sort of handshake deal that they just wanted to work together. And so that determined the course of everything that was going to happen after that. And it went very smoothly with those two. They, you know, you look at a book and you look at a movie and obviously a book is going to contain a lot more material than a movie. Um, you know, they said uh, when they were first starting the script, well, let's both separate and we'll come up with outlines and we'll see what we want to leave in from the book and what we want to take out from the book. And they did that. It took a little while. When they came together again, their outlines were exactly the same. So they were always on the same page about what the format of the movie was going to be. Although obviously different things 
changed, uh, you know, over the course of, of, of the, of the writing of the script and then the shooting of the movie. And then of course the editing Martin Scorsese and many other directors will tell you that the place where a movie is made really is the editing. So, um, and then there were casting decisions too, you know, the Warner brothers, people wanted Tom Cruise to play Henry Hill and Madonna to play Karen Hill. If that had happened, I'm not sure we would be having this phone conversation right now. Talk about what Scorsese's vision for the movie was. Why did he want to do it after he had read the book? Well, he had, you know, he told me he had not been interested in doing any movies about organized crime at this point. He hadn't, you know, and it's interesting, too, because his movies, uh, even the movies that he had made that uh, have organized crime in them, and those include uh, his classics like his breakout feature, Mean Streets, in the early 70s, and then uh, about these four young guys who are uh, young men uh, in Little Italy who uh, sort of operate at the periphery of mobsterdom. And then um, Raging Bull in 1980, in which the main character, the boxer Jake LaMotta, sort of uh, refuses to play ball with the local mob interests until he one day decides it's the only way he's going to get a shot at the championship. He plays ball with them, and that kind of contributes to his own ruin. But those weren't actual gangster movies. They had gangster movies. They had gangsters in the mix, but they weren't solely focused on gangster movies. But even with that being the case, he wasn't interested in making an organized crime movie until he read Wise Guy and he said, well, this is interesting because this is a a perspective from not the sort of Don Corleone um, head of the family, the semi-magisterial, you know, figurehead. Uh, trying to maintain order. But this is from the point of view of the ordinary foot soldier who works for an underboss and who tries to get away with everything he can get away with, both under the, uh, you know, supervision of that underboss or out of his, you know, out of his purview. And the whole idea of the, of the lifestyle is something that Henry Hill says at the end of the movie, talking about what he's giving up. Everything was for the taking. So that's the idea. It's like, well, you know, you're not a rich guy as such. You don't have investments. You don't have stocks. You don't have this. You don't have that. But anything you want, you can get it because you're a thief. You're steal. And you're you're in an organization that kind of gives you license to steal. When he talks about, you know, how uh, how Idlewild uh, Airport and to become Kennedy Airport was basically their their ATM, you know, it was better than Citibank. You know, so what's that like? What's it like to have that feeling? Uh, transgressing all social norms, you know, as he says in one of the voiceovers, you know, people who work regular jobs were suckers to them. But these guys had a lot of stresses themselves. I mean, it wasn't an easy lifestyle, not least because any minute you could just, somebody could just turn around and blow your head off. So Scorsese thought, well, this is fascinating and I could do something with this. And it also spoke to his own upbringing in Little Italy when he as a asthmatic child he couldn't really go out and do sports so he stayed in and that's a large part of where his movie love came from from watching stuff on television um he'd look out the window and he'd see variations of the thing that young henry hill sees at the beginning of the movie these uh wise guys standing around by the taxi stand the pizza parlor and they looked like they were kings of the world and so to sort of explore that that was the idea that he had that was that was kind of the drive uh, that pushed him to make this movie. And when you look at the movie today, how do you think it is held up to today? And how do you think it's held up at various points in the years since it was made? I think it's held up pretty well. I mean, I had to watch it a good number of times, uh, you know, while doing the book. And, uh, you know, I, it's not like, you know, I'm not in a hurry to watch it again, but I wouldn't, you know, if someone said watch it again, I wouldn't mind because it does hold up as a piece of filmmaking. Uh, all the elements are, uh, are impeccable. The cinematography, the sound design, the music, um, all that stuff uh, is just terrific. And uh, like I said, the dynamics, the dynamism of the movie is something else. What, what Scorsese does is what every great director should do and not enough are able to do, which is they just, they make, they put life in every frame of the movie. And by that, I don't necessarily mean realism because there's a lot of stuff in Goodfellas that is not strictly realistic. You know, at the beginning when they're killing Billy Bats for the second time, when he's dying in the trunk of their car and they stab him and they shoot him and their whole bodies are like bathed in this satanic red light coming from the 
from the rear lights of the car that's parked. That is not how it would look in real life. You know, you'd have it reflecting off your shins or whatever. But, you know, Scorsese makes it look like an old Italian horror movie, like they're literally in hell. And that kind of heightened realism uh, in his approach to the visuals of the movie, you know, I, unless you're looking to do an analysis of it, you don't necessarily notice it as such. But it really, uh, it really um, enhances the experience and makes you feel like you're immersed in this bizarre world of transgression that we're all kind of curious about, even if we are upstanding citizens for the most part in real life. How does Scorsese see this movie in the context of his overall body of work? I think he understands that it represented a turning point, although when you hear him talk about his career, uh, which I did in, in March of this year, right before the city shut down, he was the last person I interviewed for the book, and I actually got into his office five days before my manuscript was was due. So it was kind of down to the wire because he'd spent the last year uh, editing The Irishman. Uh, I think for him, I think he sees it as a turning point. It certainly led the way to other big budget movies. At the time he made the movie, he said to Amy Taubin, the film critic, he says, I want to be a player. I want to be part of, 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 of Hollywood deal making. And uh, he didn't necessarily aspire to that the way it happened to his friend, Steven Spielberg, who, you know, wound up co-founding a studio and being a major league uh, kind of executive producer and, and overseer of a corner of Hollywood. But Scorsese now certainly does have a, a large office. He, uh, attaches his name as executive producer to a number of other people's films. He runs uh, two separate uh, film preservation um, houses, the Film Foundation and film, the World Cinema Foundation. Uh, so he, he wears a lot of hats and he wields a certain amount of power, certainly on the East Coast. But uh, to hear him uh, talk about it, every film is, and this is a direct quote, a knockdown drag out fight. And uh, he, he often thinks that every film is going to be his last. So um, while he acknowledges the significance of Goodfellas, uh, he doesn't feel like its success has made life that much easier for him, his filmmaking life. It came at a time in his career that was not at the peak that we think of today. It was at a tough, tougher time in his career. Yeah, it's funny to think about it because the 80s, he made several classic films. I mean, there's um, certainly Raging Bull, there's uh, King of Comedy, but King of Comedy was a huge box office failure and it kind of hobbled him for several years. He went to, he went, made an independent film called After Hours and then he made his dream project, Last Temptation of Christ, and he ended the 80s with uh, Color of Money. Now, these are all... Uh, you know, good films or better. I think Last Temptation of Christ is one of his best pictures. I think After Hours is one of his best pictures. Then there's the the anthology film Life Lessons with Dink Nolte as well. But um, and Color, but Color of Money was his sort of second calling card movie because he knew, you know, the 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 thing that made Last Temptation happen was a complete one off deal that you know everybody involved in knew they were going to take a bath, so it was like now or never. But with Color of Money, he wanted to demonstrate to the studios that he was capable of making a film and bringing it in on time and under budget. And to hear him talk about that film, which I like a good deal and many people like, it's a, an, you know, uh, an interesting, uh, an unusual sequel to The Hustler with Paul Newman. Uh, he says, uh, he told me, well, that film's kind of mild. He says he doesn't, fight, he doesn't feel like it's full strength his own film. And the other films, as good as they are, there was in some way a sense of his diminishment as a force in movies during the 80s that Goodfellas definitely turned around. It was with Goodfellas that he became kind of the, you know, he, he got on the sort of Mount Rushmore of American directors permanently with that film. Not even because it was such a huge box office success. It was a box office success, but only moderately. But it was the accrual of of its influence over the years that really kind of solidified things. You mentioned the casting before. Talk a little bit about the cast that came together that was really sort of indigenous to Scorsese in his films and, and, and how it all came, that part of it came together. Well, he knew, I think both him and Pileggi knew that the, the people who were going to play Henry Hill and Karen Hill kind of had to be relatively new faces. They wanted to craft these characters in a way that they would register as, as, as something you would had not 
seen uh, before. So, you know, uh, Lorraine Bracco, who plays Karen Hill, was an early casting decision. Uh, she was recommended by some people. It was an interesting thing. Um, several members of the cast all lived in the same building down in Tribeca. It was a building owned by a character named Chuck Lowe. Uh, and two, uh, Robert De Niro had an apartment in it. Harvey Keitel had an apartment in it. And he was married to Lorraine Bracco at the time, so they both had an apartment in it. And Chuck Lowe ended up playing Maury in, uh, in Goodfellas, the part that he kind of like almost blustered his way into. But yeah, all these people were all in the same building at the time the film was being cast. But Lorraine Bracco was you know, highly recommended, but she had just been starting. Uh, she had a lot of stage experience and so on. Ray Liotta had been in a, a smaller film directed by the great Jonathan Demme called Something Wild, which was a, he played a, a menacing ex-boyfriend who uh, has this killer smile, but you, you can see immediately behind that smile is a, a literal killer and that, uh, that smile can turn. And so, you know, if you watch him in something wild, you think, well, this is clearly the movie that shows he can play Henry Hill. But Erwin Winkler, one of the producers on the film, wasn't quite convinced. And Liotta actually approached him in Santa Monica, I think, at a restaurant and asked him to talk outside for 10 minutes and I don't know what he said to Erwin, uh, but Erwin says after that 10 minute discussion, I said, yeah, to Marty, because Marty wanted Liotta. Yeah, we can we can go with Ray. But then as a result of having cast these two relative uh, newcomers in the lead role, Warner Brothers said, well, we need a name. We need a star. We need a name. And the funny thing is before, when when Scorsese and De Niro made King of Comedy and took a little break from working together, uh, that film's uh, failure at the box office really hurt Scorsese. But De Niro was able to go on to other films, other roles, and films that made him a bigger star than he'd ever been. One of those being Midnight Run, which made him huge. A huge movie star and usually bankable. So Raging Bull and King of Comedy, having been projects that De Niro had brought to Scorsese, here Scorsese's going to De Niro kind of saying, well, I need this favor. Will you play in this movie? And De Niro looked at the book. He's like, well, I can't play Henry Hill. And uh, then he looks a little further into the book. He says, oh, I see. I can play Jimmy. I can play Jimmy Burke. That's the guy's real name. And the, they changed it to Conway for the film. So once they signed up De Niro and he agreed to be on it, they were already, they had almost gotten into shooting by that point. But once De Niro signed on, then the studio gave them the green light to start shooting. And then the other supporting roles were from, you know, people uh, uh, like Joe Pesci, who had worked with uh, De, De Niro and and uh, and uh, Scorsese and Raging Bull, of course, an immortal performance, and had done a lot of character work in Hollywood in the interim. And then Paul Sorvino, um, and then a lot of young up and coming actors in New York who've gone on to great things, uh, Isaiah Whitlock, um, Kevin Corrigan, Michael Imperioli, who of course went on to play uh, Christopher in The Sopranos. Uh, every, every young actor in New York, when they heard that Scorsese was auditioning for this big project, were all very much like, I don't care what I have to do, I want in. So, uh, and the cast, you know, is, is just full of really memorable people, Welker White as Lois, the drug mule, and then the bamboo lounge guys, you know, and all these sort of wise guys standing around, many of whom were real life wise guys. Was it clear early on that this film was going to be successful? Not necessarily, because they pre previewed it in California and it went down like a like a like a like I'm sorry for the distasteful simile. It went down. It went down like the Hindenburg. It was just booed and, uh, you know, um, booed and hissed and uh, people walking out. They were appalled by the opening scene. Um, you know, uh, there was one screening where the sound and the audio were out of sync and, uh, you know, the, the audience is yelling, bring us Scorsese! Like they wanted to, you know, um, like they wanted to um, lynch him. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was not a good indicator for them. But, uh, and Warner Brothers was panicked and they wanted reshoots they wanted recuts and you know uh people like erwin winkler who worked with scorsese and of course michael obitz of caa who is now representing scorsese 
they had Scorsese's back on this. They arranged for him to have uh, say over final cut. So when they said cut it, he said no. And then they started getting the reviews and that saved them because the reviews were for the most part rapturous. And they used those reviews very extensively for marketing the film. And that really helped them out. So they had a good return on box office for this movie. It, it was a success and they didn't think it would be a success. Even back then, something that's two and a half hours long presents a challenge for booking. You know, you want to, you don't get the same kind of turnover of uh, houses that you, uh, you get with a 90 minute or a hundred minute film. So that was another issue. But yeah, once they, things, good things started happening, they were much happier. And, uh, and then they continued to happen. Um, the film is, you know, they can put out, uh, Warners can put out new home video, uh, new home video releases of it every, every five or 10 years for whatever anniversary it is. And they'll sell, I think 4k is coming up next. Right. What did Scorsese do immediately following Goodfellas? Um, well, um, you know, he had, uh, there was some, there was some, you know, the film business is kind of weird, um, as you know, um, so he had he had set up deals with various um uh you know he he's always had this thing where you know his own passion projects are the things he wants to do and you know he's he's always had a, a, a huge number of them lying in wait you know for a long time for instance he was going to do a, a film about Dean Martin you know uh and uh you know he's always he's always got friends or writers working on things for him. Both, both Nicholas Pileggi right now is working on a script. His friend Jay Cox is working on a separate script. So, you know, he's always got irons in the fire, but he also having, having done, um, you know, <clears throat> having done um, several um, deals, you know, with, uh, with studios, um, when he made Last Temptation of Christ, he did it with Universal and they attached to his contract with Codicil where at some point, he would do another film with Universal. So um, that became uh, Cape Fear, which is the movie he made immediately after Goodfellas, which had been developed by his friend Steven Spielberg and was going to be shot by his friend Steven Spielberg. Um, but, uh, you know, what Scorsese was thinking he was going to be doing, believe it or not, was Schindler's List. Um, that had been in Scorsese's uh, backyard for a bit. But then him and Spielberg switched. Spielberg was supposed to do Cape Fear. Scorsese was supposed to do Schindler's List. They switched. And then Cape Fear happened. And that did pretty well, but became a, probably a much more controversial movie than uh, anyone at Universal or, or Spielberg himself had, uh, had, uh, had any intention of it being. And then from there, you know, uh, by the time, you know, it, 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 it so happened that, you know, Goodfellas had really become... Uh, a huge thing in the culture. And that's when Universal again uh, had a property with Nick Pileggi about uh, a mafia connected guy who got uh, to run a casino in Las Vegas and that became Casino. And they set that up at Universal. Of course, Nick Pileggi hadn't even finished writing the book when Universal said, no, 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 don't you know, write the script first and hired Scorsese on. And that became a very, very big thing. And that kind of became uh, what he thought was going to be uh, his true gangster trilogy. That is, it would be Mean Streets, Goodfellas, and Casino. And he told Richard Schickel uh, in the early 2000s, and that's it. That's it. But of course, that's not it, because he made it into a quartet with the Irishman last year. Was Pileggi happy with how the movie turned out? Oh, he was delighted. And he loved coming back and working with, uh, he loved coming back with working with Scorsese again on Casino. And he's, as I said, he's working with Scorsese now. He says it couldn't have been better. He, he, one thing that makes Pileggi especially happy is the fact that uh, he gets to take credit for stuff he didn't even write. You know, the, uh, the How Am I Funny scene, one of the most famous scenes in Goodfellas, that doesn't come out of Pileggi's book. That comes out of a real-life incident that happened to Joe Pesci when he was uh, working with... Uh, where he was a nightclub singer in various mobbed up nightclubs in New Jersey and something he witnessed and he incorporated it into the, uh, into the, uh, into the film. But people say to him, Oh, you wrote Goodfellas. That scene, how am I funny? It's one of the great scenes. And Pelleggi can say, Oh yeah, thank you. 
<laughs> but he had nothing to do with it. But he, but see, that's the that's 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 being a smart writer because even though it wasn't part of his vision and it wasn't part of his writing, he knew enough about that world to understand how credible that was and how it would fit into his world. So that's really smart. Glenn Kenny, the book is Made Men: The Story of Goodfellas. Glenn, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, I thank you. You're uh, great to talk to you, and I hope everybody listening checks out the book and enjoys it. Thank you.